Well, welcome everybody to Summer Flying Refresher. My name is Scott Denstead. I'm a CFI and former National Weather Service Research Meteorologist. I'm also EAA's weather subject matter expert. And I'm a co-author of Pilot Weather from Solo to the Airlines, co-authored with Doug Morris. Doug is a Boeing 787 captain for Air Canada. And there's the website, pilotweatherbook.com. All right, so here's the topics we're going to cover tonight. We'll go over a brief introduction, and we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of this, talking about convection and turbulence. The two go hand in hand, so it's important to talk about those two items together. Then I want to throw in some convective hints, some things that you need to be paying attention to that will give you better decision points before and during a flight. And then I'm going to talk about a convective incident that occurred. That's probably something that maybe at some point in time one of us will run into. So I want to go through kind of the, uh, the overall scenario so you can kind of see how some even some of the most basic weather events out there can be pretty dangerous. And at the end, we'll do some question and answers. All right, so anybody who's ever come to any of my workshops or heard one of my webinars, they will for sure know that my primary focus when I do any kind of training is to focus on the big picture. The big picture is really, really important. So details are important as well, but you're going to find that the big picture is the king when it comes to making decisions. And you can see in this particular case, uh, this pickup truck here ended up uh, cutting through the guardrail and ended up in that position. Not a great, uh, not a great situation for that person, but nevertheless, wait until you see the big picture. So when you look at this, uh, that, that person in that truck evidently escaped a really bad situation. So yes, the details are important, but the big picture is the king. So I know that many pilots come to me and say, Scott, you're a meteorologist, you're a CFI, a pilot, you must have this great way of dealing with uh, pre-flight weather briefings? And the answer is yes and no. Something I can't really write on a piece of paper and hand it to somebody that says, this is how I do it. Uh, but I generally use what's called the funnel approach. And if you talk to meteorologists all around the world forecasting weather every day, they'll use a similar kind of approach. They'll start with that big weather picture. Again, start with the big picture, get a really good understanding. So you're looking at surface analysis charts, you're looking at prog charts, looking at convective outlooks, looking at constant pressure charts. We're going to do a little bit of that with the uh, incident at the end. But the big weather picture is where I draw most of my, my decision-making points, not from the details. The details can be very misleading, as we saw in that case of that pickup truck. So the big weather picture is where I kind of spend most of my energy and time. And then I work my way down to the words, the details to get to the point where I start to fill in the gaps of things that I just don't get from the big picture. And those are looking at things like uh, your terminal forecast and pilot weather reports, looking at surface observations, all those elements are really important to fill in those gaps that the big picture doesn't provide. Those are the necessary little tidbits of information you're going to need to make the good decisions about what altitude to fly, and even what route to fly. But the big weather picture really is my decision point whether I'm going to stay or I'm going to go. And we know that all forecasts that you get, and we have to rely on forecasts as pilots, are imperfect from the moment they're issued. We know that, but the goal and the thing I try to teach pilots is to how, learn how to extract truth from all these imperfect forecasts. Those forecasts are very useful. We just have to learn to extract the truth that those forecasts are telling us. And it's not very difficult to do. 
but it does take some work. And we're going to look at a few items of how to do that uh, along the way here. So meteorology, weather, is not really about black and white. It's all shades of gray. So it's all understanding how to quantify uncertainty. And so longer range forecast, two, three, four, five days out, we call that kind of the medium to long range forecasts, have a fair amount of uncertainty. Much beyond about five days, it's really, you're really dealing with whether the temperature is going to be above or below uh, the normal, whether the amount of precipitation is above or below average, really not going to get much more than that. Certainly, I'm, I can't plan a flight around that kind of a thing, but the further out in time you get, the more uncertainty you have. And so as you get closer and closer to the, your departure time, that now cast, what's going to happen in the next six hours, or essentially within a six-hour period, that's that's the, the time where you're going to fill in all the details that you looked at for these short range forecasts. So I spend most of my time, I'm going to be flying, let's say, tomorrow morning. Tonight, I'm going to spend probably about an hour looking at the forecasts. And I'm going to spend all my time kind of focused on that big picture. And when I wake up in the morning, all I'm doing is using some of the, the details I find, those terminal forecasts, pilot reports, next rad. I'm going to use those to kind of uh, complete the, the big weather picture. And so I'm not spending a lot of time in the morning, probably about 10 minutes, unless I see something that doesn't match the forecast I saw the night before. So it's really important to spend as much time as you can filling in the gaps, but but really, you're filling in the gaps from what you see in the big weather picture. So we know that a thorough pre-flight analysis you know, is going to allow us to make really good decisions in flight. And one of the things I try to emphasize is to avoid rules of thumb. I know you can you have some CFIs out there that, and maybe some uh, uh, pilots that have been, uh, been flying for many, many years have these rules of thumb. Uh, some of them are, are pretty good, but when Mother Nature's at her worst, that's usually when rules of thumb don't work. And rules of thumb tend to replace real analysis. So I, like, I don't really find rules of thumb to be very effective in making good decisions. And if you spend a cursory amount of time on, on the weather prior to a flight, that usually I find that most pilots that I've talked to that made mistakes usually means that they haven't done uh, good enough pre-flight analysis. So they're going to make poor decisions while they're in flight. So information is power. The more information you can, you can grasp, um, the better off you're going to be. And in the end, you're going to make better decisions. And when you get into the cockpit and close the door to depart, your weather analysis shouldn't stop at that point. You should be still doing a fair amount of weather analysis all the way to the point where you end up landing at your destination or your alternate if it doesn't work out. So keep that weather analysis going and use the information you learn from your pre-flight briefing uh, to make those good decisions. All right, so let's talk about this concept of convection and turbulence. So what is a thunderstorm? What is a thunderstorm? I'm just going to take a second and let you think about that. What is a thunderstorm? And I know most of you probably have a good idea of what a thunderstorm is. But I'm going to show you a definition, and I think it's probably one of the best definitions out there. It's pretty simple, but it uncovers a really important point, and that is from the National Severe Storms Lab, they define a thunderstorm as a rain shower during which you hear thunder. A rain shower during which you hear thunder. It says, since thunder comes from lightning, all thunderstorms have lightning. But the key element here is a thunderstorm is a rain shower. And we're going to cover that uh, in a couple places in this presentation. I want to emphasize that because it is the key to understanding the dangers associated with convection. So yes, a thunderstorm technically involves the presence of lightning. There's no doubt about that. I'm not going to argue that fact at all. However, I like to think of convection as the more generic description of the process. Instead of focusing on the concept of a thunderstorm, my mind is wrapped around 
convection. In fact, I like to use the term deep moist convection instead of the term thunderstorm. Because again, just because there's lightning, you know, not there's no lightning in this particular storm per se, that doesn't mean that it's not dangerous. So deep moist convection basically is what you see in the background there. Doesn't have to have lightning associated with it. It can be a shower and still be problematic from a convective turbulent standpoint. So I always ask pilots, what do you call weather phenomena one second before the first lightning strike. It's called a rain shower. And I know most pilots think of rain showers, or most people in general think of rain showers as some, something like Julie Andrews standing on top of a mountain holding an umbrella, you know, singing uh, uh, at the top of her lungs. That's not the picture that we should put in, in, our, in our heads. We should be putting in our heads a dangerous phenomenon. So. Again, what what's happens one second before that first lightning strike, it's called a rain shower. So you really can't separate convection and turbulence. The two need to really be discussed at the same time. Yes, you can have turbulence without convection, but most of the turbulence you're going to experience, whether it's thermal turbulence, summertime being bounced around a couple thousand feet above the ground, or moist turbulence in clouds, such as cumuliform clouds or cumulonimbus clouds. So we know that the concept of convection is just the vertical transport of heat. It's how Mother Nature deals with an imbalance due to solar heating. So when the sun hits the ground, heats the ground up, it doesn't heat up to 1,000 degrees. Instead, at that point in time, an imbalance is, is felt. And at that point in time, convection is the way to get rid of that imbalance because Mother Nature abhors extremes. And as a result of that, uh, Mother Nature attempts to convect the heat away from the surface to, to bring things back to an equilibrium. There's also what we call in meteorology baroclinic instability, kind of the pole to equator instability. We know the poles are really cold and the tropics are warm and that creates an imbalance and Mother Nature attempts to take warm air from the tropics and move, move it up north and cold air from the poles and move it down south. And that produces essentially our jet stream and our main uh, major weather systems, uh, areas of low pressure, our fronts. And that's what drives this baroclinic instability, drives that imbalance. And again, Mother Nature uses that method of moving air north and south to bring things back to an equilibrium. Now, there are two types of convection. Dry convection, basically invisible. These are these thermals. Again, if you've spent any time flying around in the traffic pattern or doing practice instrument approaches in, in good weather, um, you know you're going to get bounced around a fair amount if it's you know, kind of warm out in the afternoon, especially. Let's call that dry convection. There's also moist convection. As you can see in the background, there's cumuliform type of clouds. So what causes turbulence? Well, actually, it's atmospheric mixing. When the atmosphere is poised to mix, turbulence is the result. But here's the key, is that it has to occur on the scale of the size of the airplane. So a mountain wave, for instance, it has a crest-to-crest -crest kind of, of, of distance of, let's say, a kilometer or two. You know, that's technically turbulence, but we may not feel bumps in the cockpit. We may feel the up and down wash of that particular mountain wave, but we may not feel any bumps. It may be very smooth and laminar. That's because it's occurring on a very large scale. The example I give is if you were to take a car and drive it over like a gravel driveway where the gravel is maybe a, you know, a, a silver dollar size gravel, well, you're going to hear crunching of the, of the gravel underneath the tires, but you're not going to be really bounced around by that. But if you take a little remote control car, when that same gravel driveway, it's going to bounce around quite a bit because it's going to be able to feel because the, in this particular case, it's the scale of the size of, the, uh, of, of that particular vehicle, small remote control car that is producing uh, those bumps in that car itself. Now, let's go and take our vehicle, one of the supermarket or 
or mall parking lots and go over one of those big speed bumps you see in there, you're going to feel it in a car. But that remote control car is not going to feel it. It's small and it's going to go up and down over that speed bump and not feel the bump like you would in a vehicle. So again, in order to feel turbulence, it has to occur on the scale of the size of the airplane. And so essentially what happens is you get these thermals, this rising air, and you have the prevailing wind, that west to east or north to south wind, whatever it happens to be, that prevailing wind interacts with that thermal. The thermal produces that upward motion of air produces a wake, and that wake interacts with the prevailing wind, and it produces eddies on the scale of the size of the airplane. That's what we feel in the cockpit. All right, so let's look at uh, some convective hints. These are things that we should be paying close attention to. Um, and there's plenty of them out there. I want to just throw a few out there uh, that are kind of important. So anytime you look at surface observations or METARs and you see multiple cloud layers showing, such as few scattered or broken, that's an in indication that you have a convective process in place. Again, it doesn't mean that you have a thunderstorm, remember, but ultimately you have a convective process in place. And you'll see here that we have a broken 3,500, broken 6,000, broken 7,500, very common. Could have two, usually three. Gives you a good, pretty good indication you've got a convective process going in there. And especially if you see any kind of showery precipitation, that's another hint uh, that occurs. So even before, you, even, you know, again, this is not going to be a thunderstorm kind of thing. You don't see thunderstorms in there, but you know you've got a showery precipitation process with multiple cloud layers. That's a good indication you've got a convective process in place. And so convective turbulence, especially in clouds, are going to be problematic. And in you know, colder temperatures, icing is usually increased in these kind of clouds. So here's a picture of the Sirius XM um, using Garmin Pilot. What you'll notice is when you look at the next rad depiction, you're going to pay a lot of attention to what I call a cellular pattern. So that is you're flying along, uh, or even before you're flying, essentially if you see a cellular pattern, uh, that's a good indication that you've got a convective process in place. I like to look at it like you take and uh, put a uh, paintbrush and you dip it in a couple different colors and you splatter it on the wall. And when you see that kind of paint splatter look to it, and you see that cellular appearance, that's a good indication that you've got a convective process in place. Also, if you see these storm uh, center tracks here that, that define where those cells are located, that's also a good indication that the next rad's picking up on a specific cell, and it usually provides the, the, the uh, echo top height on that and the direction of movement. That's another good indication you've got a uh, convective process in place. There may not be a single lightning strike in this case, and there wasn't. Uh, none of these uh, uh, cells are really all that serious in terms of to produce any kind of, of lightning, but ultimately in this particular situation, uh, you're, you're going to want to, uh, to pay close attention to that paint splatter. Now, if, if the next right image looks more like a brush stroke instead, you're probably dealing with a more stable atmosphere not dealing with a convective turbulence uh, situation. And last but not least, make sure you're taking clues from the big wide view. So don't, I know a lot of pilots I see when flying with them, they tend to zoom way in on a particular cell or two or three. Look at the big picture, kind of zoom out and see what's going on. And you'll, again, you'll see that you'll, you'll see here that's a very cellular appearance down here, uh, just uh, south of Lake Erie. These are lake effect snow showers. Um, and again, you see that you'll, you'll have some cells being uh, defined uh, here as well. So again, this is a very cellular type of pattern. None of this may reach any kind of thunderstorm level, but it's something of being concerned. If you were climbing IFR through some of this, you may pick up some serious icing, especially near the tops of these clouds. So going back to the concept of showers, again, I want to repeat this because a forecast or any observation for showery precipitation signifies you have a convective process in place. So if you see things like showers in the vicinity, VCSH, rain showers, SHRA, or even snow showers, SHSN, that's a good indication 
that you have a convective process in place. Or even if you're listening to your local uh, TV weather broadcast, um, if they start mentioning the word showers, again, pay close attention to that. So if you were looking at a terminal forecast, for instance, uh, you would, might see something like SHRA, which means rain showers at the terminal area. But notice there's no CBs, cumulonimbus clouds, when, when any of the cloud group here, uh, because technically it's not a thunderstorm, doesn't have lightning in it, so you won't see CBs on that in that situation. But that, again, it still means you've got the possibility of a significant convective event going on here. And here's probably the best tip I can provide tonight. And that is, showery precipitation in a terminal forecast is often a placeholder for a low confidence thunderstorm event. So if forecasters are looking, let's say for instance, you're, you're gonna be looking at a terminal forecast ballot early tomorrow morning, and you see rain showers in there, most likely the forecaster is not really confident they could actually put in thunderstorms. Or maybe your convective outlook sh showing that possibility of convection tomorrow morning, some thunderstorms, but they may not have enough confidence to say for sure that that five statute mile radius uh, terminal area is going to be impacted by a thunderstorm. So they will throw rain showers in that forecast. And so the, the goal is to read the area forecast discussions. Now these are available on some of the various different apps out there. Uh, you can go to weather.gov and go to a specific uh, airport in that region and see the area forecast discussion. So it's a forecast, the area forecast discussion is not about the retired area forecast, obviously. It's about the county warning area that's, that, that weather forecast office uh, issues their forecast for. So anytime you see showery precipitation, um, the, the forecasters are hinting potentially that I'm not really 100% positive we'll get thunderstorms, but wink, wink, you probably should pay close attention because you know, that showery precipitation forecast might eventually turn into a forecast for thunderstorms. So the area forecast discussion might have some details. It's a kind of plain English text. They can put anything they want in that text. And you may see something like in this case out of my area where I'm here in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, there was a case where there was scattered showers and perhaps a thunderstorm expected across the North Carolina Piedmont from the afternoon until early evening. And here's the key. And we'll carry showers in the vicinity for now to cover that threat. So that's a great indication that you're probably going to see some thunderstorms in the region, but maybe not right in that terminal area. So this is again a hint that the forecasters are trying to tell you about. Also, clouds are really good signposts. They really will give you an indication of what's going on either you know, at your flight level, above your flight level, or even below, uh, and all the adverse weather you might face. So any vertically developed clouds likely imply significant amount of turbulence in those clouds. Even, even a very small cumulus cloud uh, can have a light to moderate turbulence in it. And when they get deeper and deeper with more vertical motion in those clouds, then you have the possibility of severe or even extreme turbulence. Generally, the blue sky around those clouds is often non-turbulent, just basically keep out of the clouds itself. Normally, in those areas, you have some descending air that's going on. It tends to be a little more stable. So again, try to stay out of those, those clouds if possible. The air below those clouds usually is turbulent. That's that dry convection I mentioned early on. So those, that air itself is usually turbulent. Not usually, if it's not, we're not talking a, you know, a really significant cell uh, most of the time that, tur uh, that turbulence is moderate, uh, but when we start to develop a really significant cell there and we start to get precip, that's when you can start to see uh, some more significant turbulence below those clouds. My general rule of thumb is to keep blue sky above me if possible. So when you look out and you see this even deck of clouds, that gives me a, a, a it makes, it puts a smile on my face because I know that above those clouds, it's probably very, very stable conditions. Since you know, stable air tends to limit vertical motion or mixing in the atmosphere, 
then it's usually pretty stable and, and very laminar flow there. So it's usually non-turbulent. So when I see that kind of even look, uh, I go for and try to get on top of those clouds. And I know for the most part, as far as I can see here, the clouds are pretty, uh, pretty even. So here's another look at this. If you see on the left, uh, you'll see kind of this, these cap clouds. And you can see all these little towers here in the background, several uh, of them, but they all tend to be about the same height. You know, they're a little bit deeper, you know, maybe uh, on the order of four or 5,000 foot deep, but they all tend to be right there at the same height. They're not really building much higher. That's because they're kind of capped with stable air above. And that capping keeps it, you know, a more, not, maybe not necessarily in, in a temperature inversion, but a more stable atmosphere above that keeps those clouds from growing at a higher altitude. And again, I try to head in that particular situation to above those clouds to stay in that non-turbulent air. But when you start to see, you know, uh, these clouds billowing way above and all different levels all over the place, you know you've got pretty unstable air above. And while you're in the blue sky, you know, around those clouds generally is pretty stable. Getting into any of those clouds would be likely pretty dangerous. Now, one of the questions I get a lot is, uh, when does a cloud start to be produce precipitation? They're looking at their onboard uh, weather, whether that's uh, Sirius XM or ADSB, and they're looking to try to figure out, you know, if I see a, uh, uh, any a kind of indication, how big is that cloud? Is that something I can fly through without finding myself, you know, upside down? Uh, the answer is really difficult to, to say with any certainty, but any time we start to see the depth of the clouds exceeding 15,000 feet, so from the base to the tops, or the tops exceed about minus 10 Celsius, uh, then we start to see a significant amount of potential for turbulence. So here was a, a, a great example. We were heading uh, uh, back to Charlotte here. We were, I think, in Texas at this point. We're heading ba basically between these two uh, uh, cells, and that was our, our cleared flight and our IFR flight plan, but we thought that was not really a good idea to try to head kind of between those two, uh, because we knew that this one on the right actually had some lightning and it was pretty deep, uh, definitely not going there, but you know, it's very possible that by the time we get to this point, this closes in, but you can notice that we get a little cell here, so by the time that we essentially get up to the point where we're looking straight down this you know, from this point here all the way to this 3F3, and we're looking straight at, down this line here, you can see now what happens. So I'm looking straight down at those, and certainly we have the ma more major storm in the back, and that cell that was kind of just that little cell here all of a sudden blossomed up into something pretty significant. So we made a good choice to go around this uh, particular cell. So when we get into the tropics, though, when we in the southeast U.S., the deep south, uh, Texas, uh, we find, or even in the tropical islands, we find that even a, uh, a, a cloud that is even 10,000 foot deep sometimes starts to produce precipitation. And here I was headed back to my home uh, airport of Rock Hill, and I noticed a little blip that came up. Uh, just with the last pass here, a little yellow area, and that's the cloud right here. And I was at 10,000 feet kind of you know, heading, heading down when I took this picture. And sure enough, um, it was producing a little bit of precip. So again, in the tropics, it's not uncommon to even have something as uh, low as 10,000 foot depth to be producing a, um, uh, some precipitation. So I want to show a, uh, a video here, and it is uh, all about high base convection. So uh, we know that, uh, you know, one of the other things I try to, to tell pilots, beware of the benign. Um, usually, we don't see accidents associated with supercell thunderstorms. Pilots just don't fly into supercell thunderstorms. You know, even, you know, uh, the, the, the most um, inexperienced pilots don't fly into supercell thunderstorms, typically. You see them in the distance, they look really ugly, you just don't go there. But most of our accents are associated with these kind of benign looking conditions. Kind of lures you in here. Looks pretty harmless. You know, maybe a little bit of spritz coming down. Uh, and, and the bases of these clouds are pretty high, over 10,000 feet from the surface. And maybe showery precipitation is occurring. This is the one that's going to get you. This is the one that's going to kill you. Not that super cell thunderstorm, but this kind of situation. So let me show you a, uh, a loop here.
what we're looking at here is a microburst. And this is sped up with time. This is obviously not uh, happening in real time here, but nevertheless, uh, your airplane would have a difficult time overcoming this kind of thing if you were headed to an airport in that particular region. This was, I think, taken near Chandler out in Arizona. And certainly it has the potential because, again, this looks pretty, pretty benign overall, and yet we see a pretty significant downdraft here, probably 75 mile an hour downdraft going on, and, and they can actually approach even, even higher than that. So that's the, something that we definitely want to avoid per se. And again, it looks pretty benign overall. So let's talk a little bit about a convective incident, kind of put all this together. So here's a, here's a case where we have a, 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 a Bonanza pilot who ended up in extreme turbulence in IMC at 7,000 feet. Um, and you can see here that that pilot side window ended up being shattered. And the pilot recovered around 2,000 feet MSL, or about 1,200 feet AGL, slightly on his back and spiraling down. Fortunately, this pilot had some pits experience, so was able to recover um, and didn't crash at that point, and ended up, as anybody would, saying, I'm done flying for today, and uh, diverted to a nearby airport in Kentucky. In this particular case, the pilot, it was a smaller airport, you know, shorter length runway, and ended up overrunning the runway, but nevertheless, uh, was able to uh, come out uh, alive. And so here's what the, the convective forecast was for this, uh, this particular day. So the flight was from the northern Poplar Grove up here in northern part of Illinois. And he was headed to an airport in Tennessee. And this is where they diverted in Kentucky here. But you notice here's the convective outlook from the Storm Prediction Center. And certainly none of that, uh, none of that route was in, was in this green area, which defines the possibility of of organized convection, even severe convection over here off the coast of Carolina and up here in the, um, uh, in the uh, Massachusetts area. So this is an indication most pilots want to see. Hey, there's no possibility of, of thunderstorms. That's probably true, but that doesn't mean you can't get a convective process going in place here. And so if you look at the surface analysis, again, look at the big picture, what you're generally seeing here is a kind of a big area high pressure. And again, we like to fly in high pressure. High pressure usually is subsiding air, and it's usually you know, fair weather, and it's also behind the front. The front has already moved through, moving off the coast. And so this, again, looks like a great day to fly. And certainly it could be, but there's some concerns that we need to, to work on. So here's what kind of happens. And so this is, again, you look at this, and here's the flight path that that particular pilot was taking. What you notice, again, is a cellular precipitation situation. So you've got cells here and there, kind of like paint splatter. And so this tells me right away that we've got a convective process in place. No doubt in my mind, this is a convective process. And so what I want to show you here is here's the flight path through this area. And this is probably the, the pilot had ADSB uh, on board. And while this is not the, the, the depiction that, that this pilot was seeing at the time, but for the most part, due to the delay in, in the data getting to that pilot in the cockpit, uh, this is probably what he saw as he was moving through this area, kind of a little light you know, precip, not, not that big of a deal. He missed the big picture, obviously, of, of the cellular structure was going on, but a little bit of just very, very light precip. But if we look at the, the actual loop here, what you'll notice is it starts out right in this area, this light blue, it moves down, you can see it develops pretty quickly. And we'll watch that loop again, and it comes in and develops pretty quickly. So that pilot ended up in that, uh, that developing cell. Again, these cells were probably not more than 25,000 foot in terms of, of height, um, the tops of those. Um, no lightning involved, but yet still a, a pretty nasty convective process that almost uh, killed this particular pilot. So what, what really completes the picture and is really not part of what most pilots look at, is the upper level chart. We call this a constant pressure chart. Now, it's a constant pressure chart, meaning that in this case is 500 millibars, or roughly 18,000 feet. The pressure is the same 
every, everywhere on this chart. So what I've done here, this is this is about six hours after this flight took place. Uh, the, in this particular case, there's a chart that's valid at 12Z and another one's valid at 0Z. The, the flight was around 18Z, sort of right in the middle, but we see this trough axis. So the trough axis where you kind of see the the bend here in the, um, the the height lines, this trough axis, kind of the demarcation between, you know, kind of disturbed weather, uh, downwind of that, upwind tends to improve. So if I were to look at where that front or that uh, uh, that trough was located, let's say six hours earlier, again, I, I they don't have a chart for that, uh, for this particular situation, was probably back more along the route of flight, uh, most likely. So that trough axis is not, not really what you would call an upper level front, but essentially that trough is where we would see some upper level instability developing. So even though that front went through, you have the colder upper air flowing you know, through this trough because essentially a trough is, is a cold pool of air aloft, uh, and you have cold air aloft and kind of warm air near the surface that you know, clear skies, the sun beating down, produces a, a fair amount of instability, and we get these instability showers that occur. And that's all coupled with the upper level feature and not necessarily the surface feature. So again, this is the kind of stuff that really is the big picture that completes the story. And so I think overall the pilot was compromised by being down low. So this is not the actual pictures the pilot was seeing, but I, it was a, a flight that I was taking and I was going to go from point A to point B at you know, roughly six or 7,000 feet. And what I was seeing out my window, I really couldn't see much. I saw some precipitation, but I was kind of low, it was sort of like you know, uh, being, uh, being the small kid looking, trying to see the parade in the street. And it wasn't until your, da you know, your, your dad put, put, put you on your shoulders that you could actually see what's going on in the street with the parade. Same kind of thing here. I was kind of low to the ground, kind of murky. I really didn't see what was going on, so I asked to get to go higher. And finally, I was able to kind of see what was above this, which was really nasty looking. So being down low, hard to really see that. It was compromised. But once I got up high enough, 12, 13, 14,000 feet, I was able to actually kind of see what was going on there. And I knew that certainly a flight through that area was not uh, something I wanted to entertain. So this particular convection didn't meet convective sigmet, sigmet criteria, so there was no advisory for it out there, um, and, and that's pretty common in these kind of situations. It just didn't meet the criteria, and there were no GRMETs issued for this because GRMETs are issued for non-convective turbulence, not convective turbulence. So again, there was no advisory out there that this pilot could have found. So you have to take those hints from looking at the next rad depiction and understanding the big picture, what's going on. So we know that a single cell pulse thunderstorm or air mass thunderstorm as it's called, um, isn't terribly dangerous for aviation. You just don't fly through it or fly under it, you go around it. You see it out there, you pick a, a, a heading to go around it and it's no big deal. And you don't have to deviate uh, very far to get around it. But when convection organizes into large areas, more than 3,000 square miles, and that's about two-thirds of the size of the state of Connecticut, um, then they become more significant. At that point in time, then you have to make larger deviations, uh, and maybe you, and now you, you, you're burning into your fuel reserves at that point in time, and now you maybe need to land early. Um, so you start making plans. When you see a convective sigmet issue, these red areas that you see on this chart, then you know you've got a threat for aviation. So forecasters will issue a convective sigmet when we start to see that, or we have a long line greater than 60 miles. Once again, you're gonna to have to make a large deviation to get around that. It will eat into your fuel reserves, and again, you wanna make sure that you don't run out of fuel trying to get to your destination. Uh, so that's one of the reasons as well. Or anytime a particular cell uh, or line or area of thunderstorms or, or indication of severe, um, that's also another reason why you'll get a convective sigmet, or they're embedded. So that's the basic philosophy behind issuing a convective sigmet. And notice, lightning is not part of the criteria here. It never is. Lightning is not the criteria for convective sigmet. So again, I like to think of the term deep moist convection. Okay, that's all folks. So uh, let's go ahead and look at any questions uh, that anybody have, and there's my um, book, Pilot Weather from Solo to the Airlines. We have a soft cover and ebook available.
at pilotweatherbook.com or you can reach me at scott at avwxworkshops.com.